And good morning, Third Church family. Welcome once again, and thank you for tuning in with us. We're going to continue Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, covering the entire second chapter on today. Please hear these words. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and, and pervasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, that, that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it was written, no eye has seen, no ear heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but himself is not subject of any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. May God add a blessing to the hearer, reader, and doer of his holy word. And I want to use for a subject this morning, church, keep planting seeds. Keep planting seeds. As I matriculated through Bible college and seminary, my understanding of the word of God grew exponentially, especially my understanding of the original languages of scripture, Hebrew and Greek. Many have often commented, that they gravitate to my style of preaching because they understand scripture and the gospel better. They say things like, well, pastor, you don't make it complicated. However, I could make sermons extremely complicated where people may respond with the complication of the sermon, wow, you know a lot, but the message would be lost in the translation. And if I did that, what would be the purpose other than being self-indulgent? Too often preachers use their intellect for listeners to be in awe of them. But I use my intellect for the listeners to be in awe of Jesus Christ. That is a significant point. Because as I have said to, on too many occasions, I don't want or need you to be in awe of me because I'm just a messenger. And I don't have a heaven for us to go to. I didn't go to prepare a place for you. I, with the help of the Holy Spirit, am just able to prepare these messages for us. So I too believe this was the case that the Apostle Paul faced when he preached to the Corinthian church, when he started their ministry. You know, back then there was no one more knowledgeable about the law of Moses or the gospel than the Apostle Paul. And Paul could have used his knowledge to impress the Judaizers, the teachers, the philosophers, and the others in Corinth who opposed him and his message. But Paul said to them, I'm not coming to you with eloquent speech, but I preach to know nothing but Jesus Christ 
and him crucified. Now, why did he do that? That would be a, a demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God so that the faith of the, the hearers of the message would be based on God's power and not man's wisdom, not man's wordsmithing or theatrical preaching. The point here is that Jesus and the crucifixion is very core to the gospel message. There are some things you can take out of the gospel message and still have Christianity, but you cannot take Jesus out of the gospel without destroying the message. The gospel without Christ crucified is, well, it's not the gospel of salvation at all. So in Paul's writing, did he literally forget every part of the Christian message except Christ and the cross? No, but what he chooses to focus only on Jesus and the cross because they are foundational to the Christian faith. I believe Paul's point is not that preachers should, shouldn't be interesting or passionate or charismatic. If the theatrics dilute or even overshadow the listeners receiving the pure message of the gospel, then the message and the messenger have failed. You, you see, for, for, for all of us, when it comes to sharing our faith in Jesus, we don't have to understand every theological detail. We just need to share Jesus' loving sacrifice on the cross and how it has changed our life and rely on the Holy Spirit to do the rest. You see, as, as smart as, and as gifted as Paul was, he came to the realization that, that spiritual success does not come from how gifted the pastor is or how good we become at sharing our faith. People coming to faith in Christ occurs because the Holy Spirit of God helps people to understand what you or I could never hope to explain it clearly enough. So again, I'm not suggesting that we should not prepare to do our best at sharing our faith. We should but we can't make it clear enough for people to understand if God is not working on their heart. I want to do a quick exegetical word study just to underscore the importance of the original language, the importance of having a couple of different translations as we do our, our word studies of the scripture. But I want you to look at these two different translations as they're put up on the screen. 1 Corinthians 2 and 7 in the NIV version and in the King James version. In the NIV version, verse 7 says, no, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. But the King James version in verse 7 says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. See, with a key word to our understanding of this text being secret in the NIV translation and the word mystery in the King James Version. Now notice the NIV says, no, we speak of God's secret wisdom, but the King James translate, but we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery. See, the Greek word pronounced here is musterion, musterion, where we get our English word mystery from. So why, you may ask, is this even relevant for our time together today? Well, let's look at the definition of the word secret. A secret is something that is not meant to be known or seen by others. While in the context of our teaching this morning, mystery means any truth that is unknowable except by divine revelation. So then the difference between mystery and secret is that mystery can be shared and still remain a mystery. A mystery waits to be revealed or discovered. A secret wants to be repressed or buried. A mystery is in suspense, but a secret is covered. A secret is a private matter, but a mystery is for public consumption. Why is this important? Because the gospel was never meant to be a secret or not known or not seen by others. Many think this is the case. And, and maybe that's why evangelism is at an all time low. 
Maybe that's why many have never shared their testimony of deliverance and how the gospel has made the ultimate difference in their life. You see, I believe the, the word choice for the NIV using secret is a poor translation and it causes confusion. Because if I believe the message of the gospel is supposed to be a secret, then I would be very hesitant in sharing it or revealing it. But listen to me, children of God, this morning. The gospel of Jesus is not a secret, but it is definitely a mystery. The gospel is a truth that is unknowable except by divine revelation. Oh, well, Apostle Paul, please help us this morning to explain this because it seems a little bit confusing. Now, he explained in one of my favorite scriptures as to why sometimes people look at me strange, they laugh at me, or even think I'm crazy when I'm trying to share with them what God has revealed to me. Listen to these words in 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. So if I were to ask you, Right now, what am I thinking? There could be some wild guesses all over the place, but the point that I'm making is you cannot know what I'm thinking about. And the only way that you can know what I'm thinking about is for me to reveal or to tell you what is on my mind. And this same idea works with God. I cannot know what is on the mind of God until God reveals it to me. If God has something for me, then God has to reveal it to me in order for me to know it and to receive it. Let's study this morning. In the 16th chapter of Matthew, hear these words, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. You see, he didn't just stumble on this. It was revealed to him. Furthermore, our scripture today, it states in, in verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew or it was revealed to them who Jesus was, then they would not have crucified him. So then it begs the question, why? Why didn't God reveal who Jesus was so that Jesus' life would be spared? Why? Because Jesus came to die. Jesus was born to die. And his death was prophesied to be our perfect sacrifice. This was the plan of God from the beginning that was eventually revealed to mankind. A plan of redemption, a plan of reconciliation, a plan to judge sin and make us right with God. And even Jesus tried to explain it before his death. But without the Holy Spirit of God in Peter at that time, he couldn't, Peter meaning, receive or understand. Hear these words in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things to the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. See, when Peter made this statement, although he believed in Jesus, the, the mystery, the mysterious truth, was not yet revealed to him by the Spirit of God. 
And in light of what I've just explained in this sermon thus far, I want you to do something for me this morning. I want everybody to, to, to close their eyes as I read these words again and let these words resonate with you based on what we've already said. First Corinthians 2 and 11, hear these words. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except a man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God. That we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. I said to myself, wow. Because for me, this was my aha moment. Because I would get weary and very frustrated in my sharing of the gospel and the truths about what God had revealed to me. And I got tired of being laughed at and talked about and ostracized. But when it made sense to me, when I understood this portion of scripture, it was like a, a, a light went off. You see, before I was saved, I would just sit in church. I would listen to sermons. I would even attend Bible study from time to time. I would hear something that sounded cool, but what I was hearing, it didn't have a lasting impact on my life because I was listening in the flesh. Meaning I, I was listening for ways to serve the flesh in a greater capacity because I was not saved. Thus, my focus was not on serving the Lord because I was serving the flesh. And because I was not saved, I was not able to serve God estranged from God. I was void the spiritual capacity to receive the spiritual truth about God, let alone being able to live it in that spiritual truth. But when I made the decision based on what I was hearing to give my life to God by accepting Jesus's blood sacrifice for my sin debt, I received God's salvation and was reconciled to God, my creator, and was able to receive the spiritual truths about God. Now understand, this is how I'm able to speak about my conversion experience now. But I couldn't articulate it like, like, like this back then when I made my decision. See, back then, I, I just says, God, I'm a sinner with no hope. No joy, no peace. I, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against others. I've sinned against myself. And I need your forgiveness. God, please save me. And, and, and why or, or, or how was I able to get to that point? It, it, was, it, it was because I continued to hear the gospel message over and over again, continue to be around those who were sharing the gospel message and living it. I continue to observe the lives of those who are saved. And I was thinking about their power, their resolve, their determination, their love for God. So God revealed to me that I need him and, and how to have a saving relationship with him for myself. And, and when I responded to God's revelation to me, I was saved. I was indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God and more of the mysteries of God were clearer to me. And all of the things that I had been, been, been hearing and not understanding became clearer. And don't get me wrong. I don't know everything there is to know about God, but, but I will know more and more every day. You know why? Because he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me every day that I am his own. But the frustration came when I knew and understood this truth about God and I would share it, the, the love of God, the salvation of God, the deliverance of God with others, even some really close to me. And they would laugh. They would say, I'm a fool. They would even chastise, even ostracize me. I didn't understand because I, I was not hellfire and brimstone sharing. You know, when people say, Receive this truth, and if you don't, you're going to hell. That was never my case. I would just share with them the gospel. 
in what I believe to be a non-judgmental, compassionate manner, and it will still be rejected. They listen, but they have still ignored the message. And I would become frustrated and sad and say to myself, how could they reject this truth about God, their creator, my creator, that was so clear to me? And what God revealed to me is the following. He says, remember where you were when others tried to reveal my truth to you. Remember where you were when others tried to reveal my truth to you. I said, yeah, God, I, I remember. I would listen and I'd just say, whatever. I would go on and continue to serve the flesh. I would reject them. That's what I remember. I would use earthly wisdom and logic to mock and undermine what they're attempting to share with me. I would laugh to myself and sometimes to their face. What they were trying to share was foolishness to me. Why? Because I was spiritually dead. And how could I respond in this, to a spiritual truth when I'm spiritually dead? God reminded me of this truth so that I could keep in mind when sharing what God has revealed to me, think about where people are spiritually. Think about where people are spiritually. Because they may not have positioned themselves for their revelation yet. They're still lost. And until they realize they're lost, they don't look to be found. But God's message to me was to continue to be a sign on the road of their life that displays the direction of salvation for when they are ready to take the road. Then what was further told to me by the Lord is number two. Remember those who didn't stop sharing the gospel with you. Remember those who did not stop sharing the gospel with you. Oh, Lord, Lord, you're right. Even when I knew the, the things that came out of my mouth were hurtful and even mean, they didn't stop sharing your good news with me. When I visibly showed that I did not want or care for what was coming out of their mouths, they continued to share your truth with me. Even when they knew I didn't understand it or was not ready to receive it, they did not stop sharing it with me. Because you see, I reflected on that as I looked over my life and I asked myself the question, where would I be if those whom the Lord had dispatched to be my road signs, my, the verbal sharers of the gospel had stopped, quit, and gave up on me? I tell you where I'd be. I'd be lost. But but, but then that, that song I used to hear, all the time it made sense to me now in a way that it never had before. The songwriter says, somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. The song went on and says, I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. God says, OK, we're not done yet. I need to make sure you're understanding that quitting is not an option. Giving up is not an option. The race is not given to the swift, but to the one that endures to the end. God reminded me again that I am a seed planter. I am a seed planter. I want you in your own devotional time to read Luke 8, verses 1 through 15, the parable of the sower. But for our time here, I want to read just a portion of this parable. In verse 11, it says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and, and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and become saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. 
the seed that fell among the thorns for those who hear. But as they go on their way and they are choked by the life's worries and riches and pleasures and they do not mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by preserving, produce a crop. You see, God reminded me that I am now a seed planter. That is my job, regardless of the field condition. I am a seed planter, and it's not my job to save anyone. I am not a failure because of the rejection of the gospel. God is responsible for the life and growth of the seeds of the gospel that are planted. But I am the seed planter. God will make the soil of the hearts receptive. And, and I may see it and I may not. My job is just keep planting seeds. And don't look for the easy fields because we all want to plant seeds in the good soil, right? Those who hear the word and, and they retain it and respond to it and give their life to the Lord. These are the easy fields. We like that. It's easy since it's easy. We look for those particular fields. But let's be honest with ourselves. Those fields are the exception, not the rule. Therefore, in my task as a seed planter, I must change my expectation. And God further reminded me that at one time my heart looked like each area of the parable where the seeds were being planted. And then I got it. I was even ignited as I began to, to look at, at, at family members and friends and even enemies among whom I have been called to plant the seeds of the gospel. When I'm planting seeds and I have to remember that there will be those who hear the truth and the devil comes and takes what I've just planted from their hearts. But I will not stop planning because God reminded me that at one time I was that person along the path who would hear the word and the devil came along and stole it from my heart. So I need to keep planning because the devil will not win. God reminded me that I was once on the rock and, and I would receive the word and would be excited about it, the, the word. And, but, but I had no root. I would be all right for a while, but when the storm came in my life, I would fall apart. I would fall away. So I have to continue planning. So, so when people are absent from the fellowship of the church for a while, please, please don't go up to them and say, wow, it's been a while. Where you been? Just say it's good to see you like they've never left B because we all have been on the rock at one time. I am reminded at times when I feel like I, I, I don't have time for, for seed planting because of, of other things that are going on in my life, that I was once among the thorns and the word of God would be choked out by life because I was going through, because I was chasing money, because I was uh, uh, living, living it up and indulging in the pleasures of this life. So as I remember, as I reflect, I keep planting seeds, even among the thorns. For those who think money is more important than ministry, I keep planting seeds among those who would rather build their kingdom rather than build God's kingdom. I keep planting seeds among those who think worry is the answer over worship because I was once there among the thorns. So as I remember where I once was, it gives me the resolve, the strength, and the energy to keep planting seeds no matter the circumstances of the soil because many are counting on all of us who have received the gift of salvation to keep planting seeds. I pray that you were enlightened this morning as I was. This sermon was very impactful for me because it gave me the opportunity to reflect on so much of my life when I was that person, and I thank God for those people who kept planting seeds until I received my revelation. And I encourage you today, keep planting seeds. Looking forward to next week, where we will ta tackle chapter three. God bless you, God keep you, and thank you for tuning in this morning.